Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Lunch and Learn for <laughs> um, the beginning of March. Can anybody believe that it's March already? I certainly can't. I mean, Tia's excited about everything. So it's <laughs> so a quick introduction. So right uh, on my left is Lily anderson Messick, Director of North Florida Programs, Trey Keeps Coordinator. And then below me uh, is Tia Silvesi. Yay. Um, so I went out with Tia, what, beginning of February? cold out yeah and so we're kind of bundled up a little bit not not too bad in the video and uh it was really good um i had a lot of fun but the video ended up being kind of short so brace yourselves for a very short lunch and learn and uh but that means we'll have lots of time for questions for tia yes and she is she does these you know you have hands-on experience with installing you know freshwater riparian native habitats. So you're ready. Great resource. Yeah. Okay. And before we get started, I have um, two things to pitch. One, we're not having a lunch and learn next week. We are just having, um, I'm taking a break. I need to start working on conference stuff. And then the week after that, we have a follow-up to our Cabbage Palms presentation with Jono Miller. It's going to be Cabbage Palms, a deep dive. And we're going to be discussing extensively um, lethal bronzing disease, which is currently affecting uh, cabbage palms and uh, some other stuff that he covers in his book and stuff he doesn't cover in his book. So I'm in the process of reading his book, um, the Palmetto book, and I hope you all have, a, have had a chance to read it. And I'm really looking forward to having him back on because he was he was just awesome. And then, of course, I uh, we can't do this without pitching the license plate. Okay, so hopefully by now you all know we have a license plate sort of on deck. All right, it's camo looking. It does have a um, <clears throat> it does have a saw palmetto leaf in the center and an orchid and some Spanish moss and stuff like that. But we really could use the funding from the sales of this license plate. But we do have to hit a certain number of license plate vouchers, um, and so please consider purchasing a license plate voucher because it will really help us, the Florida Native Plant Society, continue with our educational and conservation work. All right. Yeah. And uh, so without further ado, here is the video. Hey, my name is Tia Silvesi. I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent here at the University of Florida IFAS Extension in Orange County. Today we're going to look at some really cool native lakefront plants. These are aquatic plants and you can use them if you live on a lakefront, if you have a little bog garden or a water garden, uh, around retention ponds or any kind of wet spots in your yard. Some of these aquatic plants? Yeah. Great. So a lot of them come as a bare root plant. You can see they're not in a one gallon pot and so they're usually fresh harvested and you can get plants at native nurseries or once you have them growing you can propagate your own. So these ones here are the pickerel weed and they're one of the most common plants. You can see this one is what it looks like in a hole, but usually you just pick off this front little part here. So then you can trim the leaves and you'll get a little plant right like this. So again, this one you could break into multiple plants right here, right like so. And then you have two plants, so that's how you propagate them. So I'm gonna do a little planting demonstration um, we have the pickerel weed, we have the spike rush. This one looks kind of like a grass and it's very nice and um, tall. And then we have some iris here, the native iris, and some duck potato. 
the duck potato gets the white flowers and this grows you know in the emergent zones of the lakefront so i'll do the planting demo with these duck potatoes here so here's a here's a patch that we recently established and you can see the plants are on about a one foot center here and we have about 20 maybe 30 plants per clump so when I do these designs, I like to put, you know, the similar species in one clump and then leave a little um, blank area and then put in another species in a clump. And I find that helps with the aesthetics and for maintenance purposes too, so you can work around these areas. So here's how you plant them. We're going to just use a regular shovel and stick it into the ground. And then we're going to insert the plant right behind the shovel and pull the shovel out and so once you have it planted in there you can step on it on both sides and that pretty much um, firms it in so you can do this technique on the land or you can also do it in the water i'll demonstrate one here in the water next step step and voila there you go after you plant them you might notice some of the leaves will die a little bit that's just a little bit of transplant shock don't worry about that and look at this pretty flower here okay so here I have the sand cordgrass, and this is something that you would plant not in the water, but more upland of the water. So right about at the, um, the top line of where the water might get at the high level, that's where we would plant these. And these are great plants for protecting the shoreline because they have extensive root systems that will come down and help to stabilize the bank and reduce erosion they'll help to filter nutrients and pollutants before entering the water bodies so all these native aquatic plants they help to keep the water bodies clean and clear so we like to see a good coverage of vegetation so T wanted to show some aquatic plants in situ including invasive plants and native plants so the extension office is off of Conway Road in Orlando. So we drove to Warren Park in her cute little truck and uh, we launched into Lake Conway. native plants. Another example is the cattail. The cattail is actually a native plant and it is beneficial but it can grow a lot and so sometimes people manage it or eradicate it but it is okay to have you know some small clumps of the cattails. Here we have an example of a shoreline planting that was done really nicely. You can see these clumps of duck potato and even though they have a seawall and rocks, they have it vegetated the whole way down. So that helps keep the lakefront protected. So I want to talk to you about the zones of the lakefront. So here we have four different zones, you know, going from upland all the way to the deep water. The upland will be up on the ground, you know, above the high water mark, and you'll see plants like cypress trees, cabbage palms, um, maple trees. That's where you can plant that sand cord grass. 
And then once you start getting towards the water's edge, that's called the riparian zone. And you'll see plants there like the, um, the blue flag iris and the native canna. Um, these pickerweed here, this is a good example of the emergent plants. So they're growing in the water, but they have their leaves above the water. Um, further out from this, you can see in the deeper water, that's where the water lilies and the maiden cane grass grows. That's called the littoral zone. And then um, lastly, there's plants that are just underwater and we call those submerged plants. You know, we're here in Lake Conway and there's some beneficial plants like this Illinois pondweed. And this is a native beneficial um, submerged plant that's helping to keep the water clean. This is a good one. Also eelgrass is another beneficial submerged plant. All right, what a great day. I got to show you guys some cool native plants out in the lakefront. Yeah, it was awesome, thank you to you. Yeah, and there's so many plants, but the ones we really focus today, those are the ones that are good for, you know, commercially available, easy to find, easy to plant in any kind of little wet area. So yeah, I hope this gives everybody something to take home and, and do it themselves. Yeah, yeah. you All too right. can have an awesome shoreline. That's right, a beautiful lakefront. Yeah, thank you for sharing your expertise. Great job, that was so fun. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, sometimes you take an hour and a half of footage and it becomes an eight minute video. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so not, not much chance for people to get questions in the, in the chat, but um, I wanted to, to ask about what other plants that you liked planting alongside the cord grass that I showed early on. Yeah, so, um, you know, I talked about the zones of the lakefront and a lot of people have that kind of upland zone, which is usually like that cypress tree, the cord grass. And there's so many other, um, you know, native wildflower type of things you can plant in that area, um, like the um, goldenrod, different types of goldenrod, also the, the red hibiscus, the swamp hibiscus with that huge flower. And those look so cool, you know, along the St. John's River when they're all in bloom and they're just really beautiful and they do well, you know, they can take being submerged or they can take being a little bit dry. So, you know, all these plants are really um, versatile and, and resilient. There's also like the purple loose strife, you know, things like that. The, um, some types of Coreopsis, like Coreopsis um, floridana, and those get the beautiful, you know, yellow flowers all in a little puff. And so, you know, it's good to have some diversity of stuff and things blooming at different times of the year. And these areas, you know, if you have a, a lakefront or even just a rain garden that you're planting them around, they can be managed. You know, you can trim them back. Usually about now is a good time if they have a dead flower head and spread out the seeds and keep them, you know, kind of a little bit manicured, not, not too clean, but clean it up a little bit. Um, Randy Snyder, Mary Kime asks, um, for shopping purposes, which species of Eleocharis did you show? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure what species that was. It's, um, I don't know that I've seen Eleocharis available at many native plant nurseries. Do you guys see that available in central South Florida? Um, through some aquatic landscaping companies, they'll have it and they usually have kind of like their nursery retention pond or something, but you can check, you know, with the native plant nurseries and some of them have access to it and it might not be on their plant list per se. Yeah, but I just, I just call it spike rush and I'm not sure what species of Iliacris it is to answer your question. Uh, Teresa Blanchard asks, do people plant Illinois pondweed and eelgrass? And what besides maiden and cane grass is best for the littoral shelf? Thank you. Yeah, so um, to my knowledge, like 
normal people don't plant pond weed in, in eel grass. It's just something that naturally occurs. Some restoration teams or something might kind of plug it in, but not the general, you know, type of person. And then also for the deep water, you have your um, water lily, the white water lily. You have the cow lily, which looks like the water lily, but with the little um, yellow flower that doesn't really open up all the way. And then the maiden came. And then there's also a Lyrzea grass that looks kind of similar to our torpedo grass, but it has rough edges. And that's not really commercially available, but if you're a you know native plant buff, you should learn how to identify those two and make sure you're not taking that one out if you have some torpedo grass, the Lyrzea. Juncus is a great one. Um, oh yeah. Juncus, yeah, that's another good one. Juncus, a few, a few of these. Um, another one I love for marginal is um, Cephalanthus, the um, button bush. That's a great oh, yeah. shrub that has beautiful ball-like flowers. They're in a sphere with little stamens poking out, and butterflies love to visit those flowers. Yeah, that's a good pollinator plant. And I find that one does better kind of in like the shady areas, but it can grow in sun too. Yeah, I've seen it grow in full sun actually. Yeah. Like I'd like to hear more from participants. Like, do you live on a lakefront? Um, do you just have a, a rain garden? Uh, maybe do you have a container that doesn't have any holes in it and you have like a miniature bog garden? Um, I saw yesterday on Facebook, somebody had this cute little pot and they had the, the native blue flag iris in there and it made a real beautiful like little container, you know, bog garden. Sorry, the dogs were, I got a delivery, so. <laughs> oh, no problem. Um, yeah, so you were asking about what what are people's yeah. experience? Because, like, in, in my opinion, these are kind of, these, like, native aquatic plants, wetland plants, it's kind of a special category. Like, everybody does the butterfly plants and the native milkweeds, but, you know, a lot of Florida is underwater seasonally underwater um seasonally wet so i think it's important to kind of keep these plants um under cultivation or i don't know if that's the right word but you know have a collection of plants you know in in my own yard i have like a a little pond and i try to have like a picker weed and a duck potato and a blue flag iris and, and a canna in there and then these plants too, one reason I love them is they're really easy to propagate. So all of these things, you can just snap a little piece off and put it in a new pot. You know, they multiply like a lot. So once you have one, it's like job security. You have that plant in your little plant bank, your native aquatic plant bank, and then you can share it with others. And it's a fun little hobby for me. Um, Charlotte asks if um, she could grow uh, iris in the Fort Myers area, and so I'm just posting a link to our plant page, which shows it, you know, working fine. Great, in Southwest yeah. Southwest Florida. Yeah, I, I think it does well down there. Beware of the non-native yellow iris, which is much larger and can can become invasive. And that's a pretty yeah. There's a lot of irises out there. So stick with the native blue flag or any of our native species. And the blue flag is Iris Savinarum. It's posted in the chat. Oh, no, the blue flag would be. Oh. The, um, the Virginiana? Or oh, the, yeah, Virginiana. Oh, sorry. Savinarum is not common. Savinarum is not common. OK, sorry, I'm putting the it's Iris. Okay. <laughs> Iris Virginica, do not know yeah. everything. OK, so blue flag, Iris. There we go. I put that one in there. Sorry, I'm not really, I don't know that much about the native wildland plants. Yeah, we have the blue flag iris just growing in our like exploration gardens here at our Orange County Extension office. And it's kind of in our rain garden area, but it doesn't even really get that wet there. So it can grow 
you know, in kind of normal landscapes um, too, or if you just have moist soil or a little spot by your shower, it doesn't necessarily need to be like your outdoor shower. It doesn't necessarily need to be like right at the water's edge. Mm -hmm. And there are two native milkweed species that are really great um, marginal as marginal plants and they can uh, withstand being submerged. And that is the um, per, uh, Asclepius perennis and Asclepius incarnata, the um, pink swamp milkweed and uh, um, white swamp milkweed. The white one, yeah. Yeah, those are pretty. They're they're trying to be more commercially available. Um, the native plant nurseries always seem to be like sold out of the native milkweeds because we do such a great job of like buy native milkweed and not the tropical yeah. milkweed. So everybody looks for them and um, they can be a little finicky. Those um, native milkweeds, like the the swamp milk, well the one that the Sclepius perennis. Um, the little white one, when I find that plant in the wild, it's growing like in kind of a flood plain or a river bank and usually very dense shade. And then it's like a little dainty plant and it just has the tiny little white flower. So it could be easily missed, you know, if you have a, a landscape that's a little bit more, um, you know, vibrant, it might be kind of hard to find in something like that. But the the other one you talked about, the pink milkweed, that one actually grows like, you know, four feet tall and is really big, but I find that one likes a little bit more sun. It doesn't really do well in too much shade. But that's definitely, a, that's the one I recommend for normal people's landscapes is the Asclepius incarnata. I find it does well in like most people's, you know, home landscapes. And, and it provides a lot of leaf matter for monarchs as well. Yeah. Yeah. Ours are just starting to sprout. Like they go dormant over the winter. And then now our plants are about like six inches tall and they're just shooting up for the spring. Another one of my favorites is um, Thalia, Thalia geniculata, the um, alligator flag. It, yeah. It has big, beautiful uh, leaves, and then it has these really interesting blooms that are pendulous, and they have a really interesting pollination mechanism that when the when it's triggered by the bee, it's like a trap. It uh -huh. like grows pollen, uh, it flings pollen onto the bee. It's really neat to see in slow motion. Yeah, that's a great plant, and the, the big leaves, you know, it's real cool and tropical. It does get rather large they can yeah. get like 10 feet tall or something so a lot of people maybe don't like them kind of like cattails because they block the view or whatever but it's it's for you designing your lakefront then that's something you could put on either side you know along with your cypress trees so you can still have that clear view in the middle and plant the the smaller stuff like the picker weed and duck potato up front yeah, and I see Rory mentioned that the swamp milkweeds will spread themselves by seed. Um, the uh, Sclepius perennis is actually very prolific at producing seeds because it, it, it's possibly one of the species that doesn't require cross pollination. So it pretty much all of its flowers and it blooms almost year round. So it's continually producing seed. The Sclepius incarnata only flowers once a year and it doesn't always reliably set seed, so it's not quite as reliable at, at reseeding itself. But Asclepius perennis is very, very good at that, effective. And it it's actually our only milkweed species that doesn't require wind for seed um, dispersal. It, its seeds don't have the little fluffy things that most oh. milkweeds have on them because mm -hmm. they, um, they spread by water. Oh, they just float downstream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're like oh, little that's... discs. They're yeah. cool looking. I'll have to inspect those closer next time they um, go to seed in my yard. Yeah, yeah. The, the seeds pods, if you split them open, it's really beautiful to see them in there. They, they're like so stacked. Lovely. Yeah. They, yeah, they it's all really cool. stacked in there. Yeah. What about, do you, I, I don't know how far south it goes, but Styrax, the American um, snowbell, are you familiar with that plant? It's I see it in marginal, um, marginal areas up here. 
Yeah, I don't see that one a lot in Central Florida. Like, I mainly hang out, like, on the Econ River and Lake Conway and the Wakaiva and stuff in, in my area here. Uh, but Walter's Viburnum, that's a great one for yeah. original. Yeah, that's, like, on our list of, like, 20 native bulletproof plants that can take drought it can take flooding it's evergreen it flowers it's a pollinator plant like one of one of the best plants yeah that's a good one and i see someone mentioned the uh, elliot's aster um oh, yeah. yeah that's a great that's a very robust aster species it gets like five feet at least tall it's very floriferous produces a lot of flowers yeah, and it's covered yeah it, it it um does form dense um dense mats i guess i would say because it it grows veg it reproduces vegetatively and can form some dense colonies but i think that would be a great choice for a um marginal yeah planting yeah those asters and the the carolina aster the climbing aster is another similar species yeah they have beautiful flowers oh yeah the carolina aster that's a great one what are, what are your, some of your favorite ferns to use in uh, marginal plantings um in in my area here in central florida like the cinnamon fern uh the netted chain fern and the royal fern are the there's also the the blechnum the swamp fern that does really well but all the ferns are really cool and especially in shady areas they do great. I'm, I'm not sure how well they would do in the sun. I see them in sun if it's consistently wet. Mm -hmm. If it's areas that dry out occasionally, they don't tend to like that. But like yeah. I've seen cinnamon fern and royal fern definitely in areas that are full sun, but they're always wet. Mm. I think they just adapt. Yeah, and I've been trying to get my hands on a giant leather fern. Those are probably the coolest because they're just huge. They're like 10 feet tall and they're so green and fleshy. Like they look like prehistoric plants. But, I saw uh, one for the first time last year in Everglades. Oh, wow. Man, they're so cool, yeah. Yeah, and they are really versatile. Like I've seen those grow, you know, down south in brackish water and fresh water, you know, kind of by the coast, like in Wakaiva Springs, you know, very versatile plants. Very so do you know of anyone growing those? Um, like the native plant nursery that I frequent a lot here in Orlando is the Green Isle Gardens in Groveland. And they kind of have them on their plant list, but um, they're not currently in stock. So I don't know how hard they are to propagate. I've never propagated that one, but probably not too tricky, you know. We have a question here about good ground covers to stabilize upland around a retention pond. Okay, that'd be stuff like bacopa, um, frog fruit, um, depending on if it's sun or shade, like some of those plants, like the lyre leaf sage. Um, I don't know if you're talking about mowable type of stuff or like really low growing ground covers or the more medium type of stuff, like the elephant topis, the elephant's foot. That's a good one. And uh, there's many more, like the sunshine mimosa, if you get more dry. I know the um, blue-eyed grass is pretty good. It's not super fast growing as far as spreading an area, but it is mowable and low growing. And it can withstand, you know, marginal conditions. Um, yeah, that's a nice clumper. You might need to plant like a couple like little clumps mm -hmm. of it to get the same effect instead of like this spready crawly type of stuff and that kind of reseeds on its own too it will pop up here and there the twin flowers oh twin flower yeah mm -hmm. yeah the wet twin flower mm -hmm. yeah i mean retention ponds are kind of hard right because sometimes they have those really steep slopes and they're really yeah. droughty Another problem we run into is like the regulation. So depending on like who owns the water body or, you know, the retention pond, like if you live in an HOA or something, they might not allow plants on the retention ponds or it might be owned by 
you know, the Department of Transportation or some other entity. So, you know, be sure to check into who is the governing agency in your area if you are doing, you know, work on a real water body. You know, it might be St. John's Water Management District. It might be City of Winter Garden. You know, it could be City of Winter Park. And so check with your local municipality. And sometimes you have to talk to five different people to find out who's in charge of it. And everybody has a different form. You know, if you need to get a permit to remove the invasive species. Another thing I work a lot in is conservation areas. And these are um, parcels of land, you know, it's kind of popular in HOAs. There might be a, a lake or a cypress dome or something that they just, uh, the land around it is a conservation area. And people have like no clue on how to maintain these areas. And they have, you know, Brazilian peppers or China berry trees or some kind of like invasives growing in there. And then they don't really have, they might do the work once, you know, when the housing development is built, but they need to come up with an ongoing maintenance plan because something like a Brazilian pepper, you just don't, you know, cut it out once and then it's gone forever. You need to be pulling up the little saplings and, you know, the best thing is to replant, you know, some whack myrtles or cord grass or cypress trees or something to fill that void, you know, so there's not bare ground and you're, you know, putting a native plant buffer back in place there. Because anything that's a conservation area is related in some way to some kind of water body. Um, it could be a stream or a lake or a pond. And so they're all like hydrologically connected and that's why they deemed to be a conservation area to protect, you know, those parcels because they're all going to impact our water quality. So that's, that's something I'd like to, um, you know, put on my political platform to get more support for those types of marginalized areas that are often forgotten, but actually very important. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So someone could if they're in Orange County, they could contact you for assistance with figuring out who is responsible for a certain area. Can you, what can you plant there? Who do I contact? Yeah. And um, I also have like a little blog article I wrote on it with all those different agencies, the FDACs and water management districts. And so you kind of like, all right, well, what municipality or what, you know, water management district do you live in and, and start by calling them and, and figuring out what you need to do to do work in there. And then some things you do need like a permit and permission. Um, other things, you know, I'm sure nobody's going to complain if you get in there and just yank out a Brazilian pepper tree, you know, but um, you, you have to check about if you need a permit or not. So don't take my word for it. And in case you're yeah. also in the Orlando area and you need plants, um, Randy Snyder and Mary Kime are plugging the tar flower chapters uh, plant sale at Lou Gardens on March 12th and 13th. Good oh, job. great. Sounds great. Sorry, Lily. Oh, I was, uh, I was saying you mentioned the um, purple loose strife. And I think a lot of, if you're from the North or Northwest, a lot of people know purple loose strife as an invasive species, but Florida has a few native species. Um, they're in the same genus, but ours are obviously native. And um, they're really lovely. They're attractive to, they have purple blooms. They're attractive to butterflies and other pollinators. And some of them get really big and some of them are not quite as big, but those are a great choice for wet areas. Mm -hmm. And we had a question about dwarf fakahatchee or gamma gas from, uh, gamma, <laughs> gamma <laughs> grass from Ann Bryan. Um, I, I, don't think it would do well in an upland hard clay soil. Gamma grass, I is if it were you know somewhat moist, I would say it would probably do okay. It might survive, but it's probably not going to really prosper. Um, but it does great in slightly more moist areas, and is a really stately, beautiful, um, handsome grass. Just a great choice for a um, like an individual statement grass. Yeah, or even a clump of them. 
Yeah, I mean, in those uh, upland areas kind of adjacent to the wetlands or water bodies, you know, a lot of people plant just a mass of uh, sand core grass or it could be dwarf fakahatchee. And then you still have that view of the waterfront and you're really protecting the soil because those grasses have those roots that are, you know, reaching out and stabilizing the soil because uh, you know, the pollution, the, the phosphorus binds to the soil. So that's why we want the soil not to erode and run into the water body. And then the grasses also take up a lot of nitrogen. So all that fertilizer kind of run off, they'll suck that up and they'll hold it, you know, in their plant bodies instead of going into the water. So that's another thing I don't think we mentioned was the, the, um, removal of pollution from our environment and from our water system, which is re a really import important role that these plants play. Yeah, and the, the plants, you know, they take up these nutrients in their plant bodies. And then if if you um, are owning or manage, the, it's okay to, you know, trim the dead leaves and put them in your compost pile or in your yard waste or whatever. It's okay to do a little manicuring. Um, I like to tell people, you know, if, like the duck potato, it flowers, it has that beautiful white flower, but let it seed first and then like cut it after it's done dispersing its seeds so you can keep the cycle going. What, what palm species do you like to have around? Because I know that, you know, Saranoic is um, tolerant of inundation and didn't know if there are any other favorites that you might use. Um, yeah, I mean, mostly just the the sable palm and the saw palmetto, but the needle palm that that grows like native at Wakiva Springs State Park, real in the swamp, and you know has those giant needles coming out of its stem, so it's it's a little scary to work with. They're kind of rare. You like, I don't see them very often at all, like just in little palm collections here or there. But um, yeah, not that many really that I've worked with. I get to see the needle palm on my surveys up here in North Florida. Oh, is it more common up there? Yeah, it's common in areas where there are lime, exposed limestone that are, that are is also moist where there are like seeps coming down on ravine slopes. And um, yeah, we get to see, they're really beautiful. They can get very large. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. Um, and then don't forget about the elderberry because oh, yeah, everyone elderberry. loves native edible plants. You know, you kind of have to put a lot of sugar with it for it to taste good, but um, you know, and the birds love it and it gets those white flowers, which are also edible and pollinators love them. And it's very low maintenance kind of tree. Yeah, that's a, that's a must have in the, in the So I, I was curious, you mentioned the typha, the um, cattails. Uh -huh. uh, that is a native plant, but a lot of people consider it a nuisance, but I had heard that it is uh, kind of um, indicator species for uh, like uh, excessive nutrients in the water, like most likely from runoff from people um, or from sewage. But I was, I'm not sure if that's correct or not. And I was wondering if you knew. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure the answer to that. Um, I've worked, I worked in aquatic landscaping for about eight years uh, with a company called Lakefront Designs and Services. And you see a lot of real pristine native um, lakefronts that are a lot of cattails. And I think in nature, cattails are you know, they're kind of like a pioneer species and they help, you know, and vegetate the lakefront and suck up those nutrients and, and do great. I think they get a bad rap because people want to see the water and they don't want to look at this thick stand of cattail that they can't see through. So that's how they were kind of labeled um, nuisance. But I'm sure if there was extra nutrients in the lake, then the cattail would grow more aggressively, but they're already pretty hardy growers. So um, I'm not sure how much 
you know, the extra nutrients are really helping out, but I love, you know, my favorite place to go on that um, little lake where me and Valerie went out is like this one HOA has a boat ramp and it's like the last standing um, vegetated, like undisturbed part of that lake. And they have the cattails and that's where you'll see some of those red winged blackbirds and some other native birds are like hanging out in there and you know they have some cow lilies and pickerel weed and it's just such a pretty place that there's always teeming with all kinds of wildlife so they are really beneficial for um, habitat and wildlife even though the people don't like them have you ever used sawgrass yeah yeah sawgrass works good um and then we have jenny steibold asks what what do you recommend for upland buffers to replace fertilized lawns uh, well, we talked about like the sand cord grass planted in clumps and the things like the goldenrod or the, um, you know, some of those other ground covery type of plants. And um, there's, there's a lot of, because replacing the lawn is very important because lawns, especially Augustine grass, you know, uses a lot of water and a lot of fertilizer. So what can we replace, you know, native plants with that? And the alternative lawns, like the mobile ones, people use that sunshine mimosa, um, like the bacopa, if it's wet, but that sand cord grass, you know, and then you just trim it back once a year. Um, any kind of massing of other ground covers like that, you could even do a kunti massing or, you know, some other species that would just look green and beautiful. Yeah, I hope that answered your question. I got a few people popping in my inbox about this. Um, Jack Jordan says, if you're sure you can tolerate a large wetland grass for wildlife, southern wild rice, Zisen neopsis, uh, yeah, has worked well for rice. me. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Said anywhere that cattail would otherwise grow. Mm. Yeah, the wild rice that like just reminds me of like the Native Americans and how they ate like wild rice before, you know, all of our cultivated yeah. food today. And he also points out that celestial lily, Nema stylus, mm -hmm. which you can also call a happy hour flower, <laughs> is a great fall show. And he says it's done well for him in um, ephemeral pond margins and it's available mm -hmm. in the nursery trade and it seeds well on its own. Oh, great. Yeah, add that one to the list. And then Pat Crocker also says that um, giant leather fern is available at Sweet Bay Nursery. Oh, oh. great. She says Where's she that at? Where is Sweet Bay Nursery? Sweet Bay Nursery. Yeah, like commercially uh, finding these plants, you know, commercially available is uh, a difficult part. And then you don't want to just go into the wild and collect them either. Yeah. So once you can kind of start to get a collection and, you know, once they're more available at some of these native plant nurseries, then that would be good for increasing. Oh, Aryngium. Aryngium aquaticum. Yes. That that's a great, great butterfly plant because it, the butterflies use the flowers and it's larval food for the black eastern swallowtail butterflies. Oh, wow. Very showy, too. Makes a great, great cup flower also. The, that's uh -huh. such a cool purple. That mm -hmm. So Sweet Bay Nursery is south of Tampa, um, okay. north of Bradenton, sort of the northeast of, northeast of Sarasota and Bradenton. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I see Rory mentions um, Virginia Sweet Spire and Wax Myrtle. Those are also um, great choices. Sweet Spire is a low growing, well, not low growing, but it's a short shrub, kind of herbaceous shrub, I would say. It spreads by runners and it only gets about three to four feet tall. And then Wax Myrtle comes in a variety of sizes depending on cultivars and, and species. And that's an excellent plant for marginal. Um, pond sides as well yeah the wax myrtle is good because it doesn't get too big you know sometimes i say cypress tree and people are like no i don't want a big tree yeah. so wax myrtle is kind of a medium-sized shrub like it can look a very nice you know it grows kind of naturally in the to a nice mound on its own without a lot of trimming and it has so many benefits for wildlife too 
Well, and like if you have wax myrtle or you have elderberry or something, I mean, those are both things that re-sprout like really readily from the roots. So if you get tired of, you know, what your lake front looks like, oh, it's kind of thick, you can just go to town on it, like an anger room, and then <laughs> and then it'll come back. Yeah, well, you got to be careful with that because there are kind of rules about no cutting down trees that are maybe like four inches or more in diameter, you know, so uh, careful what you say about the waterfront pruning. Subject to local regulation. Yeah, right, exactly. Subject to local permitting. <laughs> yeah, and those all look nice together. You know, you have like one elderberry tree and one wax myrtle and then, you know, something else all in a little cluster and it just does really well together by creating that native habitat, you know, for wildlife. Do you use Lobelia cardinalis ever? Have you used that much? Yeah, I have a lot of the uh, uh, cardinal flower. Um, my problem in my yard is that the deer eat it. Oh. <laughs> but um, it, it sneaks away from the deer enough to survive and flower sometimes. That's a very showy, bright red bloom. Yeah, beautiful plant. Yeah, with the big red spikes. And it gets about, you know, four feet tall. Some of them could be huge. And it's kind of like a perennial. It comes back year after year. Uh, Rory hops in with, um, we forgot about brown savory. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Which has the, you know, the sort of colloquial common name of Florida car crash. <laughs> I haven't in heard South that Florida name. used to run off the road and then you'd, you know, everybody would know you were in an accident because you, your car smells like brown savory, just kind of minty. <laughs> really? Interesting. And it's available like pretty readily, you know, Green Isle has it. Oh, good. And it's low, right? It's so nice. it's low, it likes it wet. You can mow it. Mm -hmm. Make tea out of it. Multi-purpose plants. And then Susie um, mentions the water dropwort. Dropwort. Yep. So that's a butterfly house yeah, that's plant. A good one. Oh, good. And it's that in that umbelliferous family, you know, the carrot family, right? APAC. Mm -hmm. APAC, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those most of a lot of those family members are larval food for um, the black eastern swallowtail and several of them look really similar, like Tidemania, um, and I can't remember all the names right now. Even Angelica, um, yeah. They're... What about uh, water hemlock? Oh yeah, water hemlock. Tell us about about that. Have you ever used that? I mean, that is toxic. Well, um, it grows native, you know, in the wet areas. So I don't personally like use it for anything, but you know, it's, it's out there. And I try not to um, have it where I'm going to be walking and stuff, but I I've chopped it with my machete and stuff. And it doesn't like, it's not like poison Ivy where you get yeah. an instant rash from it, but um, I think you have to ingest it to it be poisonous. I feel like it can, it can cause nausea, maybe just rubbing up against it much really? if you're walking through it a lot. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, that, it's a beautiful, another APAC member. All yeah, of the huge flowers. Yeah, real big umbels of white blooms. Yeah, and it grows like six feet tall. Yeah. I like the dotted smart weed too. Yeah, That's such a Ooh, cool yes. little kind of ground covery, yes. you know, usually it grows in the water. Um, it can get like a little too thick, you know, and you might have to thin it out a little bit here and there, but just those little flowers are just so like dainty. You could use them in like a cut flower bouquet or something. I'm not sure if that's real commercially available. I've never seen it. Yeah. Well, while we have a lull in the questions, I'm just, in case we have new people, I'm just going to demo how to use our plant finder really quick. Great. I'm going to put it in front of you guys. Okay. So yeah, what people can see is they can see the website. Actually, I have to resize this. No, I don't. Okay. So go to uh, native plants and then native landscape plants for your area. And then here's all the plants we have. You can just scroll down. But the best thing about this is this find plants based on your location and need here. 
And so you can either put your zip code, well, not yet implemented. So Shirley is our web webmaster and she's actively working on this new, more aesthetically pleasing plant finder. So not everything works, but you can still click your county. So here I am in Osceola. So I'm gonna hit that and then say I'm looking for a part shade, bam. And she hasn't quite gotten the um, moisture needs. So sorry, but other than that, um, you can select if you want things for pollinators and then you can do it. You can even do and or, I mean, clearly she's a programmer and then submit. And then you get a list of plants based on your site conditions for your area. And then say you pick, say you're, you know, slightly evil and you want devil's walking stick. Well, if you go to the left here, you can find the plant in native nursery and then it'll, it shows that there are no native nurseries currently carrying this plant um, from fan. And then, um, if you're, if you're like a chapter leader, you can print a plant sale sheet with a, a QR code on it. So we've been implementing these QR codes for our website. And so you can print this sheet out. And then if you want to display this, people can just take a photo with that and be directed to our website. Uh, okay. I'm done with that. Thanks guys. And Whitehall says, where is swamp milkweed planted? Is it a buffer plant? Yeah, so it, it would be marginal. So it would be just above the shoreline. It definitely can grow like in the water. But where, when I see it, it's in mucky soils, you know, in swampy kind of areas. Yeah, I agree. And usually in shade, I find it. But it can take, you know, seasonal being underwater, but usually um, it's out of the water. And if you planted it too much upland, I've seen people plant it like just in yards without, and they're watering it. It looks pretty stressed. Yeah, it doesn't do well in normal yards. So put it next to your leaky hose or your rain garden or something. Rory asks when he should irrigate uh, his wetland plants in the early morning or the late afternoon. Um, irrigation and wetlands, it doesn't really go together because the wetlands should be like normally wet. So really no need for irrigation. And in our like Florida friendly landscaping program, we kind of advise against irrigation within like 15 to 25 feet of the water body because that can help carry the nutrients, you know, the nitrogen is mobile in the soil and, you know, into the waterways. So if you are like just transplanting or something, you just like use a watering can to get them established. But after that, I don't think any further irrigation should be needed. Right. So obviously, you know, I attended this presentation to be sort of a buffer on the buffer because we're using the word buffer a lot, a foil, <laughs> a foil to Marjorie's living shorelines talk which was focused on, you know, uh, ecosystems that are estuarine or have some sort of salt connection. And we had a lot of demand for, for a, you know, freshwater or people, hey, what do I do about my retention ponds? I hate that all the retention ponds are bare. But certainly some people are going to use this information for their yards, um, for, you know, having like a, a liner or a garden or just something down their downspout or they dug a hole. Um, but like, say someone's trying to create a situation like that, like say they're just managing the water that comes off their roof. If you're having right. to ir irrigate that too much, either, you know, you don't have it designed in a way that's good for the plants that you planted, you know, or you need to put those plants somewhere else. Yeah. Right. If you're just that irrigating idea, all the time. Yeah. The idea is planting native is like decreasing your water usage. <laughs> And it, um, you might need to water them to establish a newly planted, you know, plant or, or landscape. But once it's established, they shouldn't require, um, you know, regular watering or irrigation. Yeah, I have a really cool system off of my house where, you know, the all the rain, say we get a inch of rain or whatever. So it comes off of the roof down the gutter and then i have a big hole that i dug and i put a, a pond liner in it but of course the pond liner leaks so it doesn't hold the water that good but um in the summer it, it will fill up and it will be like a little pond so that goes with you know our reducing storm water 
you know, principle of like, slow down the water, sink it in your yard, don't hurry up and get rid of the water. And then in that rain garden, you know, I have plants, you know, like these irises and things that can take wet, they can take dry. And I really don't do anything to them other than like give them a little pruning and thin them out sometimes because they get pretty abundant. And so that's a really cool system. Other people have like a berm and a swale where you, the water will come and run down and then you have a depression and with a, a berm behind it. So it holds the water there and it allows the water to sink into the ground and recharge our aquifer and stuff. But that's another place where you could plant, you know, these water loving plants in the swale part, you know, think like a ditch. You could plant them there. You do have to be careful though, if you do have an actual ditch that is like running water, um, you don't really want to clog up that ditch with a lot of plants. So plant the plants, you know, not at the base of the ditch, but more on the shoulders. So that if we do have, you know, a seven inch rain event, the water can still flow through there and it won't clog up anything. You know, I just remembered another one of my favorite um, actual aquatic plants is Golden Club Arontium, mm -hmm. which is really, I see it in, um, I see it in ponds, but also in freshwater like spring runs up here in North Florida. And I'm not sure how far south that goes, but it's a beautiful species. Yeah, yeah we have some down here. And, and why do they call it Golden Club? Is it the flower? That's it's like- a flower. It's a spadix. Right. Know? And it has like the bright orange. Yeah, bright um, yellow and orange. Yeah. Oh, another one that I just thought of thinking of that same family is, is Peltandra. I love Peltandra. That's a beautiful aquatic plant that looks similar to, well, we have a couple of species, but they look similar to an elephant ear, but much more refined, I would say. <laughs> and they have a lovely, interesting fruit as well. Bright red. Oh, I don't know if I'm familiar with that one. Mostly things that look like elephant ears are usually like that wild taro or something invasive and nuisance. Well, look up Peltandra. Yeah. I'll, put it, I'll one, write it in the chat. I think we have two one. species. Yeah, there's a lot of cool plants that, you know, are in these kind of wetlandy areas and the marginal areas. Yeah, more people should get into growing native aquatic species. Yeah, and one problem we kind of have is, you know, people will hire the contractor to clear their lakefront and they'll get the permits and everything, but then all they'll plant back is pickerel weed. Yeah. And so, you know, we want to have maybe 10, a dozen different species. So just not all pickerel weed. Pickerel weed's great and I love it and it looks beautiful and it's, probably my favorite aquatic plant or one of them, but, but you need, you know, little other things too, and change it up a little bit. Another one that I've seen in salt, our long salt marshes up here in the panhandle is um, Melanthera nivea, the salt and pepper mm. shrub. Yeah. And that's a very, you know, big showy. It provides all sorts of resources for pollinators. It's a favorite for, for all sorts of little pollinators. Oh, and good one. Seems pretty, um, uh, adaptable to marginal situations. Great. Yeah, any other questions? Comments? Just some kudos there. So thank you guys. Uh, are they going to have any um, wetland or native or aquatic um, of these plants at a tar flower plant sale next weekend? I don't know. Uh, Randy question. Snyder, Mary Kime, Mandy. <laughs> there. Oh, Rory just mentioned, I started my wetland garden by not mowing anymore. Okay. The pomandra and smartweed and ferns were in there waiting oh. to emerge. And that's I think that's a great point for starting a prairie or a um, wetland is to just stop mowing and see what comes up. You're going to have to know what the invasives look like in order to weed them out. But just, you know, you can use iNaturalist to ID some of the plants in there and figure out what's native and what's not. And um, 
that's a great a great advice yeah not yeah. mowing may be better for some people in some situations rather than others so i mean if you stop mowing and all you have is torpedo grass and you know in in other invasives don't be afraid to start mowing again like don't be like oh maybe there's something in there like if you don't have the seed bank you don't have the seed bank but yeah. there's no harm in just stopping mowing a certain patch that's wet and then see if anything good comes up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes there's that seasonal mowing too. Like right now for my Bahia grass lawn, it's kind of like a wildflower lawn too. So I have like the lyre leaf sage and the flea bane and these things coming up and I won't mow it until, you know, maybe May and let all those plants like flower and seed and then I'll mow it, you know, during the summer and make it look, you know, acceptable by my neighbors and stuff. Oh, also, you know, one genera of plants that I feel like is greatly overlooked and is very, would be very useful in the horticultural industry and, and in landscaping are our native carrot species, our sedges. Oh yeah. Um, Oh, those the, chunky sedges, like the yeah, the carrots, mimosa, the is big and got these bristly like blooms, and carrots verrucosa is yeah. really beautiful. It's kind of gray blue color and very large. And then we have smaller ones, Iana carpa and um, carrots gray eye. There are all sorts of. We have over eighty carrot species native to Florida, and a lot most of them are marginal plants. So. I would love to see more growers growing. Yeah. yeah, April, if you're watching this, you know, please <laughs> get some seeds. April works at Green Isle. Um, and yeah, those are great and underrated plants. And I'd so, be happy to collect seeds for you and mail them if you need any. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let me know. Right. Sedges have edges. Yes. Yes, we just had Lauren Anderson, Dr. Lauren Anderson up well-known botanist in the state of Florida on our um, FNPS after hours. And he, I learned from him when I first started learning the difference between sedges and grasses and rushes. And he had that little rhyme, um, sedges have edges, rushes are round, grasses have joints when the cops aren't around. <laughs> <laughs> that's a funny that's his, thing. That's his joke. He's full of puns and, and <laughs> little humor like that. Such a punny man. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so while we're talking about, you know, if you're really into these native aquatics and you want to talk to a native aquatic nursery person, Sean Patton of Stocking Savvy will be at our conference. So, you know, I do these lunch and learns. Most of them are members only. Some of them are public. You're at a public one. But before we had the lunch and learns, we had the annual conference and that was our main programming. So we still put a lot of effort into our conference. I'm wearing conference t-shirt from our last in-person conference in 2019. And so um, please consider attending. It will be virtual, um, uh, sort of like the Lunch and Learns, but with more networking. And Sean will have a booth. He'll have a virtual booth so you can talk to him and ask him, him all your questions that you maybe didn't get to today or you, you forgot. So I'm posting our conference link here. Oh, nope. I did not copy the link appropriately. And registration is open now. If you want to go ahead and register. Yes. And we're going to have games too. We're going to have virtual field trips and um, plant ID games, which all of us nerds love. <laughs> oh, it's not just a game. It is a contest. Like oh, a contest. get competitive. Yeah. I mean, we have winners, we have, you know, prizes. different categories, prizes. Yeah. That's, I mean, this is who else are you going to show off, you know, all of this knowledge to <laughs> us, show it off to us. Who else will appreciate it? We know your family. <laughs> All, all my poor friends that are like, there she goes again, <laughs> as I start ranting off Latin name. So. <laughs> oh, uh, Mary, Mary Keim or Randy says probably at least a few marginal wetland species at that tar flower plant sale coming up. Oh, great. I, I don't know who they're getting them from, but I'm glad they're going to have them. All right, so um, there's no other questions in the chat. So I guess I'll let everybody go since we um, in some manner made it to 1 p.m. <laughs> well, thanks so much for having me, guys. What a pleasure to be here and talk about native plants today. Thank you so much for all the work you do, Tia. 
Yeah. And if anybody has a plant question about your native aquatic plants, feel free to email me or if you need a little picker weed plant or something, let me know. We got tons of them here. Nice. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tia. It was so fun hanging out with you and I'll film you anytime. All right. We get back out on the kayaks. Sounds good. Okay. Have a great weekend, okay. everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye.